I've been using the Google Pixel 8 and 8 Pro for a while now. I've taken these phones basically around the world with me. And the only reason that I've waited till now to talk about them is they're complicated. These are the most exciting, smartest, most futuristic phones that I really want to tell you are the best phones I've ever seen. But I can't. The packaging you'll get them with is pretty simple. So this is the Pixel 8. And then this is the Pixel 8 Pro. And each one comes with a manual, charging cable, and an adapter to switch from your last phone. So when I first picked these phones up and I experienced the design, I thought, yes. The Pixel 8s look and feel basically like the Pixel 7s, the same space age aesthetic with ultra minimal speaker grills, but they're a lot more comfortable. This silky frosted glass that you get on the Pro, this material right here, this is what every phone should be made of. And I've always said that the pebble is like the most comfortable shape that a smartphone can be. And well, with these new rounded corners, this is the closest we've been in a while. Now I know some people don't like the Pixel's whole visor thing. I've got a friend who keeps telling me it looks like your phone is wearing a headband, but I think it's great. This visor, it keeps the cameras high up on the phones. Your hands are completely clear of them. It's symmetrical, so when you put it on a table, you don't get any weird rattling when you tap the sides of the screen. The only thing that I don't like is that they've given the Pro a glossy visor and saved the matte one for the base Pixel 8. And the matte is just way better. It doesn't attract fingerprints, it doesn't get scratched as easily. This one does. But at least the visors are very slightly raised in front of the cameras, so your cameras are safe. And then next to those cameras, we've got a brand new temperature sensor on the Pro. Why do we have a temperature sensor? On first glance, it seems really dumb. And it doesn't exactly get clearer when you open up the new thermometer app to use it. I mean, the thing just looks like a template that's been drawn out in Microsoft Paint, including an image that's very obviously like 240p resolution. The app basically allows you to go up close to household objects and measure the temperature. Okay. I mean, I don't see people doing that for enjoyment. And then for it to be an actually useful tool, it needs to be laser precise. But it isn't. Point it at the same object from the same distance, and every single time the reading is different. Close enough to get a ballpark idea, but not close enough to be a professional piece of equipment. So here's my hot take. I think Google put this in solely for the purposes of human temperature detection. The idea that, you know, you're feeling sick, your pixel is the first thing you can reach for to get a second opinion. In fact, earlier this year, before the phones were even announced, we saw a leaked video showing how you can move the sensor across your forehead to get a reading. That is a great feature if it works, because, I mean, I feel like people now are more conscious about getting sick than they've ever been before. And your phone is like the one thing that you can pretty much guarantee you will always have with you. It's just that if you want to be able to claim that your device can take your body temperature, then that requires proper medical clearance which takes time. So at the last minute, realizing that this clearance is not gonna be ready for the phone's launch, I'm thinking that Google just quickly scrambled together another random alternate use for the temperature sensor just so they could still talk about it. Regardless of if that's true or not, right now, temperature sensor feels like a bit of a miss, but the rest of the design is close to perfect for me. And then you properly dive into the software with Google's version of the new Android 14. And this is both where I have some of my biggest problems, but also in so many ways, this is the user experience that I've dreamed of. Most of the time, the animations are silky smooth and the attention to detail with them is sublime. Like just for example, the way that your screen turns on depends on how the phone is unlocked. Like if you use the power button, the animation starts from the power button. If you use the fingerprint scanner, it starts from the middle of your screen. And if it's face unlock, the front camera will be the center point. Or another one, you know when you want to gesture back and forth within an app, you kind of pull in from the side. Well, when you pull in here, what you're pulling is this little arrow. It'll stay attached to the border of the screen until you pull it with enough pressure for it to dislocate. When it bounces forward off the border with momentum that has physical impact thanks to the soft vibrations of the phone. It's very subtle, but it's this kind of stuff that really makes it feel like you're interacting with objects that have real weight and presence. And I gotta say, whoever is on Google's team making these kinds of minute but meaningful decisions, you have my respect. It's a large part of what separates the Pixel from other Androids for me. And the haptic vibration experience all around, whether you're typing or feeling that slight bump you get every time you scroll past an app, or when you're using this in-screen fingerprint scanner, it is top class. But it's not just about animations. It's just the software as a whole feels very attentive. It feels very tuned in to what people want. Like, you know when you hear a song playing in a store and you start bopping along and you wanna know what it is, and then you realize that your phone has not just figured it out for you, but is presenting the information to you on a platter on your always on display. One of the flights I was on recently, I just lost my internet connection and suddenly remembered I had no idea what time I was landing. But then I pulled out my Pixel and it was just there. The information was on my lock screen. The phone's packed with tutorials that explain how all the more complex things work and that is great. Because 
I don't think anyone is going to be able to pick up a phone as advanced as the Pixel 8 and actually make the most of it without them. Every phone could do with more of these, to be honest. Oh yeah, and the Google Assistant, more human than ever before. I was using this a few days ago to prepare for an interview with a very important person, actually. You will see that soon. But I was essentially going on a really long walk and having the phone dictate articles on the internet to me, and it sounds way less artificial than it does on my iPhone. Plus, you have the ability to control speed. So you can get it to reach you at 0.5x speed, or if you're some kind of very gifted person 3x speed. You've got improved speech recognition. I was using the Google Translate conversation mode as literally my only way to communicate with the people in Senegal when I was out there recently. I've been using this with my aunt, who's Italian, and literally speaks like four words of English. It's still not quite perfect. You have to wait between each person talking so the phone can keep up, but it's good enough that I've been able to have conversations that I could never have had before. So the intelligence of the software is a practicality win, but it's also got some customizability perks. Like, you have the ability to ask AI to design the perfect wallpaper for you. As a concept, this is freaking insane. In my life, I have spent many days worth of time scrolling endlessly through wallpaper apps, watching 25 second full screen ads every two minutes just to try and find what I'm looking for. And so all of a sudden, just being able to ask for it is, what's like a childhood dream. Now, it can't make absolutely anything. It does have parameters that it works within, like minerals or paintings, but that hasn't stopped me making tons of wallpapers that I feel really happy with and that I'm almost attached to because I know they're one of a kind. I find the categories, they're actually just useful because they guide it towards things that naturally make for good wallpapers. And then the software can take that wallpaper and theme itself around it. It'll give you these color palette options, and when you pick one, you will see those colors throughout your entire user interface, your widgets, and even your lock screen. You can also finally pick what shortcuts you want on your lock screen, which is cool, but it's a bit too limited right now for me to actually say it's useful. But then you've got the headline software feature, seven years of updates. Oh, wow. What? We already thought it was pretty crazy that Samsung has started guaranteeing four. Apple's had a lot of credit over the years for doing five plus, seven? I mean, I don't imagine most thousand dollar flagship phone purchases are going to use one phone for seven years. But still, seven years of updates means that anyone who then buys the phone in the second hand market could still keep up to date. And that's awesome. Now, Google does have a pretty colorful history of discontinuing products that don't quickly build up large user bases. So this could have come from a place of, let's make this massive promise and only deliver on it if it really does translate to a big boost in pixel sales. I've seen this sentiment a lot, but I'm optimistic. So far, Google has always delivered on its pixel update promises. Plus, I think the thing that I haven't seen being talked about is that it's getting easier to keep a phone up to date. You know, the major Android versions, they're not changing as much as they used to. So this idea of promising seven years of updates, it's a lot, it's generous. But at the same time, it's not this insurmountable hurdle that they've just put up for themselves. And also, one of the complaints that's often lodged against Pixel phones specifically is that a lot of things that are marketed as if they're hardware features are actually just software features that are very soon brought to other Pixels too, so you don't actually need to buy the latest to get the latest. And while yes, this is true, it happens, a lot of the things that you might think think our Pixel 8 exclusive because of how they're positioned might not necessarily stay that way. But I mean, first of all, they're not the only company that does this. I mean, that's very much what the iPhone event was like this year too. And secondly, it's not a bad thing that a company is supporting their older models. That's the harder thing to do for them. And it also means that while you're not the main beneficiary at the very beginning, when you go out and you buy the latest, you become the beneficiary when the next phone gets launched and you realize that you actually don't need to rush out and buy it. So there's a lot of good about this software, clearly. But for me, it has also been a pretty major source of frustration. But before that all makes sense, we need to talk about the cameras. This is gonna feel like a very strange thing to say. For a phone this intelligent, whose primary focus is the cameras, and who's just supposedly had every camera upgraded and is now apparently the best camera on a smartphone, but I think the Pixel 8 and 8 Pro's cameras need quite a bit of work. The hardware is strong on paper. Both Pixels have the same 50 megapixel main camera. And then while the Pixel 8 pairs that with a 12 megapixel ultrawide, the Pixel 8 Pro pairs it with an even wider 48 megapixel ultrawide, and then a 48 megapixel five times telephoto camera. And I love this trend of not just having one good main camera, but also kitting out each camera sensor. Because I think it's important when you're taking a photo to not be thinking, oh, 
which one of these cameras have the best sensor quality again? And more just, which camera creatively suits the shot that I'm trying to take? And the Pixel 8 Pro, it definitely achieves that feeling. Like the telephoto camera, thanks to the combination of five times magnification and really smart machine learning, manages to retain sharpness all the way to 20 times and even 30 times in some cases, which is its maximum amount of zoom. When was the last time you saw a phone that could actually get to its max zoom and still take a satisfactory shot? You don't get that feeling as much with the normal Pixel 8, because the ultra wide is weaker and there's no telephoto. But since it's a $699 phone as opposed to the $999 Pro, the fact that you're at least still getting a proper flag main camera, that's about the best you could hope for. Right, so what's my beef then? Well, essentially that these are the most technically sophisticated, intelligent cameras I've ever seen on a phone, but with a whole load of weird limitations that slowly eat away at that. Like when you're in portrait mode, it forces you to digitally crop in a minimum of 1.5 times for some bizarre reason. And then even weirder is that you can't zoom in more than three times. One of the main camera upgrades that you're paying the difference in price for on the Pro is this new five times telephoto camera. Why on earth would they not allow you to use it here? The same is true for slow motion, where, well, you can zoom in up to seven times, but it doesn't switch to your telephoto camera. It uses seven times digital zoom, and it looks terrible. You've got this awesome new blur feature, which lets you shoot cinematic video that I would genuinely say looks more realistic than both Samsung and Apple's, but it's capped at 1080p compared to their 4K, and also doesn't work on the front cameras. And also, only the Pro gets the Pro camera settings, which I realize sounds like an obvious statement, but you can't help but feel hard done by with the normal Pixel 8, because given that this is one of those rare situations where both phones have the exact same chip and the exact same main camera hardware. So why is it that I can use this one to take proper 50 megapixel shots, but I can't use this one to do the same? Do you see what I mean with these cameras? Like it just feels like there's so many unnecessary fences being put up here that just make it feel like you're not making the most of the great hardware you're getting. And then there's a the lack of polish. Like the transition between lenses, it feels pretty rough. It's laggy and the actual viewpoint is jumping quite a lot every time there's a switch. So anytime you want to shoot a video where you're moving in between these various focal lengths, it's not a great look. The stabilization is very bipolar. With good lighting, the fact that you have really heavy electronic stabilization applied is mostly a good thing. It means that you can just walk and your footage is so smooth that it almost looks like you're using a gimbal, especially when using this pan mode, which further slows down your footage and adds an extra layer of stabilization without even a hit to resolution. I love this feature. I'd actually probably use it to film bits of our videos if the quality of the video itself was a bit higher, but I'm getting to that. And then the thing with electronic image stabilization is that as the light starts to dip, gets worse. And what was once an ultra stable camera is replaced by a camera that's constantly trying to hold itself stable, but ends up creating lots of weird blurring and artifacts in the process. In times like this, I would say that not everything needs to be ultra stable. It's fine to be a little shaky if it avoids the artificial feeling, because that's life. And then when you pair this weird stabilization with the fact that video can still get decently grainy as soon as you hit like middle lighting conditions, and sometimes the output of the Pixel 8 and Pixel 8 Pro can just look straight up bad. Like, here's the latest iPhone in the same scene. It's not perfect either, but distinctly better at managing tricky lighting and the switching between its various lenses. It's still better than the Pixel 7s were last year, but it's just, I feel like with Samsung and Apple this year, the camera improvements to these tricky scenarios have been even bigger than this. Now, Google does have two features coming later in the year, which are Video Night Sight, aka Improved Low Light Video, and then Video Boost, which is this really unusual one where once you've taken a video and it's backed up online, Google will run it through their servers, upgrade the colors and the details and then just pop it back into your library for you. It's a bit of a strange offering, but if Google does actually deliver with both of these features, then that would fix two of my biggest complaints with the Pixel camera. It's just, well, Video Boost isn't coming to the normal 8, just the 8 Pro. And it's at this point, a promise. It's a, even if the products aren't quite right now, don't worry, we got you. If I already felt really good about the cameras and they were promising bonuses, then I'd be comfortable with that. And I side with the fact that they will probably deliver, but because there are things that aren't right now that I think need fixing, buying the phones at this moment in time feels like a bit of a gamble. Now that said, there are a lot of redeeming qualities. Like the phones already do take really detailed, clear, high quality photos with realistic colors all around. The new iPhones still come out a bit more detailed thanks to them now shooting in 24 megapixel as opposed to the 12.5 megapixel that these shoot at. But in terms of the quality of the image, this is high. And then you've got best take, which is kind of like the next era of Google's top shot feature. When you took a bunch of similar photos, your phone could previously identify which was the best and serve it to you. But now it can actually create 
create a hybrid of all of them where everyone looks their individual best for up to five people. Part of me finds it a bit creepy. It's like the most real, visceral example of photo manipulation. In a way that the shot you end up with as a whole is not actually the real moment that was captured. But then on the other hand, it's a very intelligent solution to a very human problem that I, and I'm sure most of you, have also come across. Like it or not, this is the way that phone cameras are headed. And then Audio Magic Eraser is another one of those situations where you see it in action for the first time and you feel like you've just witnessed magic. It figures out the different layers in the audio. For example, there might be a wind layer or a general background noise layer. It separates them into separate compartments and it allows you to erase whichever ones you want. Like if you're trying to focus on a conversation you were having, but there's some really annoying music in the background, it'll figure that out and delete the music. And this doesn't need to be videos taken on the phone. It can be any video, which creates a really weird situation for me because we use background noise removal a lot for our videos. And this phone is actually a much faster way of doing it than a proper professional using top of the line editing software. And it can't fix everything, but then again, neither can those programs. And in our experience, every audio track that is fixable, this can and it will fix. So we'll be legitimately sending our videos from a Mac Pro this size to a phone this size to do the work on. That's the sign of a good feature. And at this point, there are tons of examples of this. The way the phone can add a light source that shapes light around a person's face. The magic eraser, which can not just remove distractions, but also camouflage them. And this is also apparently getting better later this year. And then of course, this new magic editor, which includes the erasing, but also just goes further. And it's one thing seeing the feature get announced on stage, but it's a very different feeling seeing fundamental parts of a photo that you've just taken being changed like this. The ability to erase people, to move people, and the sky swapping. I've seen phones that can swap skies before, but not like this. This is genuinely jaw-droppingly realistic. And more importantly, it's all presented in a package that basically anyone can understand and use. Okay, now, with all of that in mind, here is where we talk about the drawbacks. For starters, all of this generative AI stuff, for anything that has to like use AI to create something, so things like the AI wallpaper making and the magic editor, they need a permanent internet connection because every action you take needs to be passed through Google servers. Plus for Magic Editor, your photos also have to be backed up to your Google account before it's willing to even try and process them. And what that means is, while definitely impressive, this whole process is nowhere near as seamless as it was painted out to be. Google actually showed us this demo on stage of a lady in front of a waterfall. They showed how easy it would be to just erase people in the background, get rid of her shoulder strap, pick her up, move her around the image, and then swap out the sky. What an insane demo. But the reality, is quite different. And to show my point, I downloaded the same image, and this is what it's actually like. The phone will sometimes struggle to identify what counts as a person in the background, and so it's fiddly to select. There's a lot of waiting time in between each action. Like, just to erase one set of people, it's a whole new loading screen. And then, for every like fourth or fifth action I take, I keep getting this error that Magic Editor is unable to show results that might violate its terms, which is very confusing given that this is literally the exact demo that Google gave. Now, I don't want this to take away from the fact that what it's actually doing is amazing, but it just feels so sluggish that you're constantly reminded of how it's not running on device. It doesn't feel like your phone is doing this processing and the power is in your hands. It very much feels like you've just got access to a login to an AI website that's doing it on your phone's behalf. And it's not just the cloud editing that feels slow. The entire editing suite on this phone it chugs. And it really makes you realize that the Tensor G3 chip inside this phone is not quite flagship level. It leans very heavily on the AI aspect to be able to do some of these really cool pixel things, but the raw power, especially the graphics power, is lacking. Think of this like a more modern version of like the Apple A14 chip from three years ago in terms of its ability to play games. And because it's got less computational power, it's less good at general computing. So basically any task that Google hasn't specifically optimized it for will naturally happen a bit slower than it would on the competition. The phones just generally are not the most stable. Like sometimes the screen has stopped responding and apps have just randomly bugged out. And then there's the thermals. Two times while I've been using the Pixel 8 Pro for prolonged periods of time, one while I was doing lots of video samples and one while I was using it as a hotspot. Well, that's a fun bit of irony. This phone has gotten hot. And when it gets hot, everything has lagged. Like the camera feed, for example, has just become really choppy and you just know that the phone is screaming for you to stop. So those are the major problems I faced. Then we've got a whole load of minor ones. So signal. Signal and core quality in my experience has been pretty good, but not the best. Signal is the one thing that's very hard to scientifically test just because 
because of how many variables there are, but it's felt like it's dropped more often than my iPhone 15 Pro when I'm hotspotting, which I do a lot of. And it looks like why that is, is that Google is not using the latest and greatest 5G modem in these phones. They're using a revised version of an older modem. I spent ages trying to get some of the new Google Assistant features to work, like the ability to now ask Google's barred AI much more complex questions, the new upgraded call screening features, and the ability to summarize internet pages for you, only to realize that they're actually not available in my country yet. They're US exclusive for the foreseeable future, which was not communicated very clearly at all. The face unlock is good when it works, but it's just not as secure as Face ID on the iPhone, and also needs to be quite a bit closer to your face, as it's not using infrared or anything, it's basically just taking a photo. And the fingerprint scanner has been completely fine, there's no problem, but it's just slower than some other phones using more advanced tech. Okay. That's a lot of stuff. Now, just before we bring it together, screens and battery. So the screens are actually both great, and it feels like they've made sensible compromises on the base 8, such that it doesn't feel like you're missing much. They're both 120 hertz, very bright screens. The 8 Pro is actually meant to go even brighter, but honestly, I can't tell the difference. They're both good. The base Pixel 7 had a pretty noticeable chin on it. It was no American dad, but you know, you could tell. The base Pixel 8, it still has a bit of a chin on it, but it's trimmed down. It's subtle enough now that you can decide not to notice it. The 8 Pro is higher resolution than the 8, but by default actually comes set to a slightly lower resolution, just below 1080p, which is quite unusual, but honestly sharp enough that I've not really noticed or felt like I needed to bump it up. The Pro also has slightly stronger glass, and the final perk is that while both phones can dial their refresh rate up to 120Hz, this can go down to 1Hz, whereas this can only go down to 60Hz. And this does make a bit of a difference to battery. I'm relieved to say that finally, the Pixel 8 Pro feels like a pro for battery life. Like 7 to 8 hours of screen on time has been a pretty normal thing for me to reach, but the counterpoint to that is that the base Pixel is a decent amount behind. It's fine battery life for someone who's generally a bit hands-off with their phone, but for me, the normal Pixel 8 has been just about enough to get through the day, but to the point where I'm getting back to my charger in the evening with a trickle of sweat running down my forehead. One new feature that really does help though is this new focus on battery estimations, of it being less about specifically what percentage you're on, and more about if you continue in the app that you're in with your current levels of power draw, exactly what time you will run out. Okay, so should you buy the Pixel 8 and the Pixel 8 Pro? And should you be enjoying this video, then a sub to the channel would be appreciate it. it. I really want to say yes. No phone has convinced me of the AI future that we're moving towards more than these two right here. They are exceptionally smart, but just a little too much in a way that makes it feel like a concept phone. A phone with a set of really cool, really powerful specific highlights that genuinely do feel like a glimpse into the future, but then a slight neglect when it comes to the more simple things, like signal and video quality and thermals. Not to mention just far too much being left in the hands of what's coming soon, what's not available yet. There's actually a lot more of that that I've not even covered in this video, like zoom enhance that can improve what photos look like when you crop into them after capture, improve magic eraser performance, etc, etc, etc. But at the same time, I do think these phones have such a high potential ceiling that I do want to give them the chance to see if they can actually get there. So. I would say this, let's let them sit for three months, and then let's see if we get to the fixes that we need. And then I'll either make a full update video here on YouTube, or I'll do a Twitter thread. So be sure to be following on there, and I will catch you in the next one.